Washington, D.C. to finish the work Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. started when he said, We are coming to get our check. Chicago. What about LA? All right. I heard we had some folks here from Texas and also Florida, Connecticut, Maryland. What about VA? Reparations. First of all, let's give our black selves a black hand for showing up today. Absolutely. All right, y'all. Peace, love, and reparations. We're so grateful to be here for our first FBA rally for reparations. So I just want to set the tone and the mood. We want to give thanks and praise to the Most High for bringing us out today, as well as our ancestors that shining down on us. Look at this beautiful weather. It is never this warm in D.C. in November ever. So we know that our mission and everything that we set out to do is blessed and highly favored. So we're really grateful uh, for this experience. So we're coming to Washington, D.C. We are here in Washington, D.C. to finish the work that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. started when he said, we're coming to get our checks from the government for breaking his promise of 40 acres and a mule. According to the special field orders number 15 issued by General T. Sherman after the American Civil War, it's time for America to cut the check. Absolutely. We're also continuing the legacy of our living elder, Dr. Paul Anderson, Also, our ancestor who's shining down on us, Dr. Francis Crest Wilson. <laughs> so, and many others who led the charge for our justice claim as, we, as, as well as helped us identify the system of racism, white supremacy. And so what we're here to do today is to discuss lineage-based reparations, right, for our ethnic group. Right? So when we say Foundational Black American, it is not an organization, it's not a political club, it's not a political party. It refers to a lineage and an ethnicity. Our ancestors are owed a debt from chattel slavery in this country. Can I get an amen? All right, so we're all on the same page. And while we understand that there are other folks in, in the space who may um, be our brothers and sisters from across the diaspora. So we're grateful to have y'all here as well. Let's clap it up for them. Thank you. Because we understand that white supremacy is a global prison system and it affects all of us. And what we're here talking about today is our lineage-based reparations in America because they owe us a debt. So I'm going to bring up several people and I'll be coming back on, um, but we're going to do some interviews. But before we get there, I want us to also get grounded in what we mean exactly as we're talking about reparations. Well, what is it, right? So our sister Camilla Moore brought to our attention that there's an international definition of reparations and it consists of five pillars. So before you leave here today, I'm gonna to make sure we all know the five pillars of reparations and what is owed to us, how and why. So the first pillar is compensation. That's cash. Clap it up for some cash. Yep. The second pillar is restitution, right? We want restitution from things like stolen land, stolen labor, our intellectual property, all of our inventions that were stolen that our ancestors didn't get credit for, even some things that we may have created that we haven't gotten credit for. And also, black Americans' cultural contributions to American society and really to, to, to the world. You see how they're trying to hijack hip hop. They've hijacked the blues, jazz, and everything else. Those are our cultural creations. So that falls under number two, which is restitution. Number three, rehabilitation. That means 
free, Medica free medical care, education, legal and trauma services, right? So that's rehabilitation, making us whole after we have been, you know, done this atrocity to help us heal. That's number three. Number four is satisfaction. So it's like symbolic forms of reparations such as a formal apology, the removal of Confederate statues, placing our own statues up. I want to see a statue up of Dr. Francis Christ Wilson. I want to see a statue up of Dr. Dr. Clark and so many other people, right? So that will fall under satisfaction. Those are symbolic gestures that, you know, American can do to right their wrongs for our ma'afa, our black American Holocaust, all right? And number five is a guarantee of non-repetition. This is so important. We need policies such as like an anti-black hate crime bill to hold people accountable to make sure that these race soldiers don't continue to hurt us. We need to make sure that we're able to hold on to our civil rights and our God-given rights in this country so that slavery doesn't repeat itself. So that falls under number five, guarantee of repetition. So I'm just gonna read them off really quickly. The five pillars of reparations according to international law. One, compensation, repeat after me, compensation. compensation. Two, restitution. restitution. Three, rehabilitation. rehabilitation. Four, satisfaction. satisfaction. And five, guarantee of non-repetition. Clap it up for yourselves. All right, so we are gonna bring up the first person that we're gonna interview. I'm gonna interview real quick on the stage. You're gonna get to know them. If you don't know them, we're gonna bring up Dr. Randy Short. Clap it up for Dr. Short. Oh, yeah. Said an early bird, gonna get the word. Dr. Short, like go ahead and introduce yourself. DC, are you here? <laughs> this is Dr. Randy Short, a DC native of the public schools and a victim where we don't have states' rights for us. We're being replaced, but we ain't going nowhere. Marion Barry lives in all of us. Chocolate City will not be erased. This is a day that God made, foreordained that we would stand because we're gonna get our money, we're gonna get our freedom, and our lifetime, not someday, but now. Somebody say now. 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 And there's a little word, I'm going to keep it clean for the family. Thank you. It's called MFM. You figure out what the F is, but one is mother and the other is money. Can y'all say MFM? MFM. We want all our MFM. Y'all should feel proud of yourselves. Give yourselves a hand. Joe Biden's had to get a new set of pins because they're in their pants worried about a generation of us that are not going to be like the boomers, that we want our checks cut. We want our checks cut now. There's no force under heaven that can stop even two or three of us from getting what we want if we want it. We are able to skate backwards. We've been able to survive hundreds of years of genocide and slavery. Getting a check is a cherry on the pie. If we really want it. If we really want it, we'll get it. Cali House was what I call a WASI. Can y'all say WASI? WASI. A WASI stands for a warrior sister, a real solid black woman, a queen, a goddess, a portal of life. She's not a pork chop feminist. She is a warrior, she's a mother, she's a lover, she's a sister. She was born in Tennessee in the 1860s. She's one of the founders of one of the things that was called the ex-slave mutual relief and bounty, and I got it, and pension. That's what they wanted. Y'all, want, I want y'all to be clear that Cali House with uh, Isaiah Dickerson got over 300,000 black people nationally to want reparations 
This is even before Marcus Garvey's movement started. Understand that they had at least 300,000 people, and all of them knew 10 people. Out of 10 or 12 million black folks, 3 million of us wanted reparations. And understand, that was like 125 years ago. 123 years ago, the U.S. government decided that we would not have reparations, and they've never stopped. But Cali House was framed, lied on, maligned, jailed in 1916. She died in the 1920s in her 60s. But you know what? Her spirit never died because we're here today. That's right. Even if we hear about Garvey, let's be honest. One of the things we've got to come together on is that everybody that makes a contribution, whether male or female, young or old, needs to be given equal weight in the court. Sometimes women don't get their fair shape. We need to stop that where it does exist and where the women are getting too much cut it back and where the men need to get attention and praise given it. I think that Garvey's movement was bigger, about 10 times larger than Callie House, but she's a woman and the government destroyed Callie House before they even got around to Garvey. They went after Garvey in the 1920s. They took him down by 1921, he was done. Cali House, they got even faster. The FBI, what became the FBI, went after Cali House long before Marcus Garvey even came to the United States. So there had been an effort against her and the grassroots, foundational black Americans getting anything. In fact, some people like the idea of us going back to Africa. I love Africa. Africa's beautiful, but America's my home. I have African lineage, African heritage, but I live here, we built here, and we want to get paid off of here. The idea of reparations, everybody has gotten it but us. The Union soldiers who were white got reparations. In fact, 80 years ago, they had the bonus march right here. The thing that made the bonus march go crazy was not that there were just whites, but black and whites together demanding reparations for having served in World War I. And the U.S. Army literally came down this Pennsylvania Avenue with tanks and tear gas, shooting and beating people. They did not want the blacks to get it. It's all about stopping us because the wealth and riches of this nation has been taken out of the blood and the bones of our ancestors, and they're more against us getting paid than anybody else. And the only way that this can be corrected is it's gotta be just for us, about us, and now. Absolutely. Clap it up for Dr. Randy Short, you all. Next up, we have our brother, Raheem Shabazz. Clap it up, clap it up. Peace and Black Power family. Peace, love, and reparation. All these set apologies in the form of reparation. Cut the check. When I think about the reparation movement, right? I think about a movement and not a moment. And what I think about is Queen Mother Moore, who started way back in the days and, and popularized the reparation yeah, movement. Amazing. But before we go to her, we got to go to Cali House. Now the brother, he was just up here and he was talking about Cali House, right? She was a black woman that started the Ex-Slaves Mutual Relief and Pension Association. And this was in the 1800s. But if you want to go further back than that, we can go further back than that. And all these movements were started by a black woman, right? And then if you want to go, we can go to Chicago to the, to the uh, Third Ward. It was a sister named Dorothy Tillman. And she started a reparation movement. And what she did in the city, she said she was an alderman. She said, in order to do business with this city, you have to show us where your money comes from. And if your money comes from slaves, then they was able to sue. And that got started in 11 cities. We need to pick that back up. Right? So the reparations is not a moment, it's a movement. And we gotta seize the moment while we in this movement. My personal commitment is not only to amplify the voice, 
my voice, but my, my commitment is to amplify everybody's voice, you know, because we all know that the choir is louder than the soloist, right? So it ain't just one individual, it's all of us. And all of us together, we gotta amplify the voice. What we really have to do, when we come in the room, there's two type of people, right? There are those that check the temperature, and there are those that raise the temperature. I'm one of the people that's gonna raise the temperature and make the goddamn enemy sweat. Cause we want our check, right? Well, in order to start teaching them about it, you gotta have the education, right? The only way you're gonna get an education is if we educate ourselves. So the number one thing is what we gotta do, we gotta stop sending our children to the open enemies. We gotta have those that look like us to educate our kids. They gotta see us Clap it up. from our worldview in yes. our eyes, right? Malcolm X told us we are the only people to allow the open enemy to educate our kids, right? We are the holders and the keepers of our self and responsibility. So our number of responsibility is to educate them. And in terms of reparations, we gotta let them know, right, that this is a protracted movement. This ain't something that's gonna happen overnight, but in the long run, it's gonna happen. And the most revolutionary thing that we can do is to marry black. And I'ma say peace and power, FBA all day. When it comes to incarceration, we have to go back to the beginning of it, you know what I mean? And it starts in the school system, the school to prison pipeline, which my documentary is about. And we know that they look at the third and fourth grade reading level, right? And if you're not reading on grade level, by the time you're in the third or fourth grade, there's a 75% chance you're going to end up in prison. And these prisons are sold on the stock market. When you go to these private prisons website, right, and you look at the ticker, you see the stock market on there. And they also have a model. If we build it, they will come. So they look at this and they know how many prisons to build 10 to 15 years in advance. So what we have to do is we have to teach our children. We have to let them know who the open enemy is. And we have to educate them so they don't fall up in the school to prison pipeline. Absolutely. Thank you. Give it up for our brother Raheem. Peace, love, and reparations, family. <laughs> So good that sun is shining. Tell them my feet kicked up like I ain't trying. Yeah. This is what I want to tell me. Yeah. Gangs out here, let's run it. Yeah. Five out here, 100. Yeah. I've been on game like EA. Sip it too soon, that pregame. Sign up on two, that three way. I was swim fast like we lay. I just thank God I did take. How can I not? Yeah, we straight. She just stop being like relay. Yeah, it's on me like prepaid. If you ain't hip, you adios. I just feel lucky that part of Getting that brain like I'm on the road. I have my girls like Our next speaker is none other than the beautiful Christy Williams. I just want to say this is beautiful. When I walked up, I was just like, wow. This this is beautiful. Black is beautiful, isn't it? Well, people need to understand when I say Creek Freedmen, that means that the Creek Nation in Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, enslaved my ancestors, my people, my great-great-grandfather, who came on the Trail of Tears as a slave, not as a kumbaya moment, but as a slave. And so when we talk about reparations in Oklahoma, we're, we're not only talking about national reparations, we're talking about reparations from the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, and we're talking about reparations from these tribes who owe us too. So one of the things that we did in Tulsa, and I say we because I didn't do it by myself, but we changed the narrative from riot to massacre. So don't let anyone tell you it was a race riot. It was a massacre. They used the term riot, so that way it, it, it implied that it was from both sides. And we know that didn't happen. So we have to tell the truth. So just changing that narrative was important. And I also serve on the 1921 Mass Graves Oversight Committee, where we are finding our, our ancestors in these mass graves. And just before I left, we found 18 more uh, bodies, and seven of those were children. And so we are still on, on the path of that. It's really hard because we're still fighting the city. 
Um, and the city of Tulsa wants to look good while it's doing nothing. And so, you know, and then it goes back to that question. How can we ask the same people who played a huge role in the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre to investigate itself, right? So while we're on this oversight committee, we understand what we're fighting. And so please be on the lookout for information about that. Give us the support, your prayers, your love, as we continue to fight and fight and fight for our ancestors, especially as we're pulling them out of these mass graves. Because I literally pulled them out myself. Me and our city councilor, Vanessa Hall Harper, the only black city councilor in Tulsa, we literally pulled these bodies up out our, ourselves with the archaeologists there because we're not just letting white hands touch on our ancestors. So that's what we're doing. I say take everything from here today, network with people, go back home, and organize, get, get your issues together, your goals, what you want to do, what, what, what you want to accomplish in your community and do it. And then you can call on a lot of people here that's willing to help you to get those things done. I always say young people do what they see us do. It's always not what we tell them to do, but what they see us do. I grew up watching my parents organize and I hated that. Our house was always the meeting house. I used to hate when I'd come home and see that. And I used to hate when my parents would drag me to city council meetings and, and to go out holding up uh, signs, picketing things and businesses. I used to hate that because I wanted to go be with my friends and it was embarrassing to be out there with my parents doing that kind of stuff. So I never thought that I would be doing this one day. I never thought that I would be doing this one day. So it's really what they, what, what they see you do. We have to be the example and bring your children with you. Bring your children with you to things that you do in your communities. You, like kids should be here today and I see some out here, this is great. But again, it, like, kids do what they see us do. And so it's up to us. It, it starts with us and it's gonna end with our children. Um, like the city of Tulsa have the equality indicators where they measure the inequities of black people in Tulsa. We came out on the bottom of the barrel on everything from housing to education to health care. So we're creating policies in all of those areas and we're trying to get these pushed through the city council. So I always say reparations is cash and land and everything else is just good damn policy. And so that's what we have to have. Thank you so much, Christy. Y'all clap it up for Miss Williams. So the next person we're gonna bring up, clap it up for this man, show him some love. Y'all don't know what y'all about to see. This is our brother Sharif Sheffy. So our Nobody brother Sharif as soon as we step has out the cage, uh, we raising no exhibit no mistake. where he has shown up in DC because I've seen it, I've been there in front of the Supreme Court, in front of Mitch McConnell's house. At reparations meetings and these national conversations, wearing iron and chains as a reminder of the debt that is owed. Show this brother some love right quick. First of all, I want to say, I'm going to all my brothers and sisters around the world, and you brothers are right here, and your sisters are here, I love y'all. I want to do this because I want to make sure that our young people understand, like, when we leave, they are responsible for our, for our next move. And it's on us to make sure that we give them the next move. And what I'm trying to get everybody to understand, like, the lost man shame of America with three Ks, and that you know that this is all about white supremacy. Our people have suffered for many, many years. And one thing that I want y'all to know, if you can Google just the Joe Biden administration alone, they are giving out trillions and trillions of dollars to Ukraine. And it's impossible that we cannot get a nickel, one nickel, towards reparation. Our ancestors have been slaughtered. Who's gonna protect us? So it's our obligation to make sure those young people understand their freedom and understand that freedom is not free. I know I'm in the process now going to South Carolina to open up the new museum there um, January the 23rd, uh, 2023. Um, our history has to be told. Our history cannot be hidden. So thank you for having me and I appreciate you. Thank you so much.
take your time, going out shot. Clap it up for our brother Sharif Sheffy. All right. Next uh -huh. up, we have someone from LA. Anybody here from LA? Dewan B has, first of all, he's a music historian. I don't care if it's the blues, if it's about jazz, if it's about hip hop, Dewan B got the facts. He's a music historian and he's a podcast host. The podcast is called Hotepish and Incense and Ashtrays. Give it up for our brother Dewan B. What up, y'all? What up, y'all? How y'all doing? Y'all good? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's beautiful to see y'all. This is beautiful. So what's up, Jay? What's going on? I just want you to um, talk about like when you first got interested or involved in the reparations movement. I got interested because uh, Dr. Claw Anderson came to my church when I was 12. Clap it up. Uh, uh, right around the time he released Black Labor, White Wealth, um, there was this other church that my church was like a sister church with, uh, Crenshaw Christian Center out in L.A., and uh, Fred Price and his mustache allowed Dr. Paul Anderson to come on down. And so as a kid, I was like, who is this dude? He said something I ain't never heard before. He sound different than Al Sharpton. He sound different than Jesse Jackson. You know what I mean? Like, who is this dude? And then I never saw him again for a long time until Hit the Colors. And so, hey, that's what really got me into it. He was, he, he was unapologetically black, you know? Like... Y'all know how it is when y'all watch TV. These people be over there tip tapping and everything. Like, I don't know. I don't know if I want to be black or not. And they don't know. <laughs> Dr. Claude Anderson came and sat down, put his chin up, and spoke for black people. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just something about that that made me be like, okay, I like this dude. Uh, let's think about this. Black people invented every form of music that's out there. Yeah. Country western, hip hop. Jazz, blues, whatever it is, we named it. If everything, everything squared, we, we made it. So if we have our money, if we have our restitution, if on a shoestring budget we can create one Motown Records, what can we do with our money? We would never need these other people who are canceling Nike contracts and all this stuff. That part. If we have the money, to fund it. Like, I think about it like this. My great-grandfather invented the automatic railroad crossing. That when the, when the train come, it trips and the automatic... My great-grandfather invented that out of uh, Benton Harbor, Michigan. If... And he was the grandson of a slave that was supposed to be freed in 1855. In 1855, he was supposed to be freed, but the Mississippi state governor came in and said... Due to unforeseen circumstances, yeah, your slave master freed you in your will, but we ain't letting it happen. They had land in Notches, Mississippi. Notches, Mississippi in the 1850s was the richest, some of the richest land in America. My family would have gotten that land. Since we didn't get that land, they had to move up to Benton Harbor, Michigan. And when he invented the automatic World War crossing, he had to sell it. What if he had that land that was passed down to him? And he had the money from that land. And then when he invented the automatic World War Crossing, who would have funded it? Us. Okay, us. I'm the fifth generation that would have been profiting from that investment. So when we think about it, if we go back in our families, all of us have a grandfather, grand uncle that did something great. And we're not benefiting, benefiting on it because of the color of our skin. So that's why we need reparations. I'm also, a, I don't do it that much anymore, but I'm also a stand-up comic. When I'm out there in Hollywood, you should see, when we could, when we at the open mics, you see all the people that write for the, all the tonight shows, all the white boys in the back taking notes. You say, you say a joke at the open mic, taking notes. Next thing you know, you look up, your show is on late night TV and you still broke. So that's what they do with us. In, 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 we need reparations because not only do they steal from us on the lowest level, when we finally get something going, they sabotage it. Like in uh, in LA, we have you got you got Chocolate Sunday, nigga night. You got uh, Black Monday, nigga night. Then you got Negro Tuesday, nigga night. They only let us perform on one night of the week, and then that one night of the week that we perform, 
it create it, it makes up for the full budget for the week for the whole comedy club. And so we literally keep these places open. We keep their ideas open. When you look at uh, Sweetback, what, he, what Melvin Van Peebles did. When you look at Oscar Michaud, what he did. Every time Hollywood needs a lifeline, it comes to us. But we're the least paid. And then if you notice the move that was made about 10 years ago, when black actors were talking about getting our money and making more money, what did they do? They brought in Africans and people from across the diaspora. That's right. And no disrespect to them, but they willing to work for slave labor. We ain't. It's time to get our check. Keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, because this is a multi-generational effort. Cash reparations is just the first thing. That's first. <laughs> like, this is the down payment, you dig? We got to pass this on to our kids, because you know what? We going to get them the cash. But then we're going to need city, city cash reparations, state cash reparations, federal, private businesses, all those re Hollywood reparations, education reparations. We need all these reparations. We need more reparations than Al Sharpton got perms. We need reparations. And so it, it's a continual process. We as a people got to keep pushing it. It's a lot of love in here. I feel the love. I love y'all. And make sure we do this. When we talk about approaching with love, that doesn't mean letting somebody kick your butt. Love means loving yourself to the point to where you won't take what they have to give you. Love means treating other black people and forgiving other black people the way Democrats forgive white folks. That's love. And love each other, love yourself, love your family, and I love you. So we are probably about four hours into the FBA reparations rally. I'm hungry. I got food in my hand. I was walking by and I heard this man say something about bucking. Somebody was bucking their eyes or something and I just felt compelled to talk to you. <laughs> yes, I think you, was, uh, you overheard a statement when I was talking to a, a gentleman. I said my family and friends, when I told them I was coming to a reparations rally, their eyes started bucking, you know. I said, I'm going to a reparations rally. They said, oh, oh, what you mean you want to a reparations rally? I was like, uh, in Washington, D.C. And, you know, my cousins, my family, my friends, nobody encouraged me. I came up here impromptu, left 1 a.m. in the morning from Atlanta, Georgia, and drove up here. Got here two hours ago, and it's the best experience ever. I'm glad to be here with my people with the same like mine. You don't, get to, you don't get to meet this kind of people in the real world. You know, it's very few people who have this mentality. So I'm glad to be around the family. Uh, and I'm glad to know other people feel the same way as I feel, you know, and it's a blessing to see Dr. Boyce Watkins, uh, Tariq Nasheed, and all the leaders here presenting today, and I'm so happy to come, and it was so worth it, you know. Next up, also from California, we have the lovely attorney, Miss Connie Collins. <laughs> If we had greater lead time, this is love. This is family. This is who we are. This is our culture. What this rally is about, it's about us. It's about our culture. See how naturally we didn't feel any type of way. This is what we do. We are here in the nation's capital that we built, right? Look around you. Who did this? Who did this? We did this, right? Who designed Washington, D.C.? Somebody. Benjamin Banneker, a freedman, a foundational black American. So what my message is today, hold your head high every day. Don't let anybody tell you that you don't have a right to define who you are as a people, who we are as a people. We are freedmen. We are recognized by the federal government as emancipated persons, formerly enslaved. Don't let anybody, oh, you used to be a slave, damn right. Damn right. And we survived. And we're resilient. And we're improvisational. We are the most creative, athletic, 
intelligent, artistic, creative, loving, kind. For we were freed men, foundational black Americans. So what I want you guys to take away from this today, this is like a recalibration of who we are. This movement is beautiful. It, I don't think it's been since 1965, since the Civil Rights Movement. This is a humanitarian movement. This is the first time that we put ourselves first. They have us so convinced we got to bring these people with us, the brown people, the LGBTQ, the people who swim in the sea, right? Don't fall for that anymore. Do not fall for that. You stand strong. You don't have to drag anybody on our coattails. We're great people. And as they say, to whom much is given, much is expected. We've been a very humble people. Very humble. If we were half, one-tenth, one-thirty-second as violent as they said we were, nobody would be here. Because we're humble. Because we're great. Because we're family. And then they'll tell you, oh, you don't have a culture. Now let's talk about family. They say we have no culture. So we watch the media. What do they do on the media? They don't show you a full black family. They don't show you a full black family. They're going to show you a black man with another. A black woman with another. Right? They're going to show a single mother. What this movement is about, you're out here. You're being active. That means you're being an activist in this moment. You are being an activist just by being here. Now, what I need you to do, this is a, a mini call to action. When you leave here, you make sure you pick a lane and do something. Some of you start with the media. Get busy. Start contacting the media and say, I don't like the visuals. We don't have to keep saying this is how it is. This is not how it is. You know, let's look at the Kyrie situation. Let's look at that. taking away from this, Kyrie caught a stray. Kyrie caught a stray, but the message they're, they're sending us is none of us get to speak. Not against the people that are coming after him, but anybody. If you pay attention, any other ethnic group, if you say something about Latinos, you've got to apologize. You've got to write a check. You say something about Asians, you've got to write a check, right? You say something about Eastern Europeans, you got to write a check, lose your career. Fat people, no offense to fat people, I love to eat. However, fat people and black American freedmen are the only people that can be insulted in this country and have no repercussions. So it's time to wake up. Now back to family and culture. One of the things that I hear a lot of us saying is, oh, I'm just regular black. Who's regular black? All the regular blacks step forward. I want to see you so I can talk, so I can talk about you. Okay. You're not regular black. You're original black. The term black is not to be argued. No offense to immigrants. If you're allying with us, we welcome you. We consider you brothers and sisters if you are on code. If you are on code. What being on code means as another type of black person, a black immigrant, that means that you do not speak against us in our country, in the land that we built. You do not speak against reparations. You do not get on television talking about them lazy people. They need to get over slavery. That's what's holding them back. Does anybody tell the Jews to get over the Holocaust? Does anybody tell the Armenians to get over the Armenian Genocide? No. We are the only people that isn't allowed to have a past, a present, and a future. We are the only people that are told, get over it. You'll just do better. And what that really means is kiss up 
to the whites. And we're seeing a lot of immigrants come here and they're coming for comfort. And that's why they get along so well. We're, we can't forget because we need our reparations. Our generational wealth was stolen. Why would we forget? Why would we forget what happened to our ancestors? Why would we forget our history? We see white supremacists saying, oh, we, we, we see white supremacists saying, hey, you know what? We're just, you know, the Confederate flag, you know, we're just honoring our history. Why is it that everybody else gets to honor our history and we're supposed to have our heads hung low? No more. No more. We have a right to have a history. We have a right to speak on all of the atrocities and injustices heaped upon us. And that's why we're demanding reparations. If we don't get reparations, we don't get reparations, we're doomed. How are we the poorest people in the nation that we built? We were here before the founding of this country. How are we the bottom rung of the ladder? That is intentional, it is systematic. So when people tell you reparations is a handout, or you're just lazy, you wanna be a victim, first of all, yeah, I'm a victim. How come everybody else gets to be a victim, right? Everybody gets to talk about who victimized them and, and, and you know, like people don't even know this. The Jews are still getting reparations from the United States, right? Joe Biden, Joe Biden said after he was pushed and pushed and pushed and thank you for the grassroots because we're pushing this reparations conversation. So Joe Biden said, you know what? I'm not interested in reparations. And then one day he switched up. Oh yeah, I'm for reparations as long as the Native Americans get it. What? First of all, the Native, the Native American, I'm not even going, going to go into the full history of Native Americans. The Native Americans just got half of Oklahoma's land. They have casinos. Some of them get hundreds of thousands of dollars when they turn 21. They have nothing to do with us. We have a different justice claim. This is not a handout. This is a debt. It is a debt for 250 years and sometimes more for being sold by West Africans to white Europeans, to being kidnapped, to being sexually trafficked, to being separated from our families. We're gonna get real dirty about this because everybody wants to talk about slavery as if it's just some hard work. No, we're gonna talk about this today. Our parents, our forefathers, our ancestors, not our parents, sorry about that, they were raped. Know this if you don't know your history. Men, women, children, and babies. Everything that is illegal today was legal then. That's why we're old. It's a government sanctioned atrocity and injustice. We worked sometimes till the meat fell off our bones. Literally. And then they killed them because they were of no use. We were fed, our babies were fed to alligators. These are the things if you don't know, dig into your history so you know why you are old. Reparations. This is getting heavy. I know, it's not a pretty topic, right? But we need to know what happened to us. All these uh, patents that we have, we had just during um, enslavement, we had 50,000 patents from enslavement to reconstruction and we have even more, I'll get into that in a minute. But we did that during enslavement. A lot of people don't know this, the way to get free was to enrich your slave master create something, save his life, I forgot what else. We have been inventing and being geniuses since we set foot here. The best culinary dishes come from us, right? Southern food is us. So we're owed for slavery. Um, we built our own cities and towns. Two to three hundreds of our towns were burnt down or flooded. You've all heard of Black Wall Street. We had many Black Wall Streets, not just one. Know your history. We had towns with airports, train stations, libraries, grocery stores. Know your history. Dig deep. 
We've never stood a chance. There's nothing wrong with us, family. We are good at uniting, but we're dealing with a devil that's good at destruction. We're dealing with a devil that erases our history. Okay, you know when they talk about a handout? How many times do white people give handouts? I'm just going to talk about one of them. When you look around and you see white people with all these beautiful homes, whatever city you live in, every little pocket, the Homestead Act. They were given free land and land grants to farm and homes. And as long as they farmed them for the first five years, free. Meanwhile, we were here. We didn't get that. Then we went through 34, 35 years Denial of GI benefits, denial of Social Security benefits, denial of unemployment. But we've been here paying taxes. But white people got that, but you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Now, let's think about mass incarceration. We all know about how the officers of today derive from the overseers. That's right. Right back to prison, right? Denied education, right? medical apartheid, gentrification, driving freeways, uh, building freeways through our community. And now we're seeing a repeat of the Homestead Act where white immigrants came in, got free land, and now we're seeing Joe Biden flooding this country with illegal immigrants. I don't begrudge illegal immigrants a place in our society, but the government is supposed to protect it's citizens. We are citizens. The government is supposed to ensure our prosperity. Look at what uh, uh, Mayor Eric Adams is doing. How do you get an Xbox, a place to live, free transportation vouchers, uh, cash cards, and we have black Americans living on the street at the homeless rate of 50%. This is what reparations is about, and don't you hang your head. Don't you let anybody tell you, oh, you're being divisive. You're being xenophobic. No, what you're doing is you're being you. Hold your head up. Delineate. We have a lineage. We are black American freedmen. That's who we are. We are foundational black Americans. What I'm going to start closing with is I hit all the points of why we're old reparations. This is not a handout. When the government does wrong, they pay. We just told you they paid the Jews. We told you um, they paid the Native Americans. They paid the Japanese. They paid other harmed groups. They paid the Romanians. They paid the white slave owners for freeing us. You know why? Because we were property. They got reparations, but all of a sudden everybody becomes a financial guru. When it comes to us getting reparations, well, where, where are you going to get that money from? Well, who going to pay that? Oh, you're going to break the country. But we're sending money to Nazi Ukrainians. Right? Hand over fist. We're sending foreign aid to every country in the world that the United States destabilizes. But people want to know where the money's coming from. They just churn it out when they need it, right? Where's the money coming from to send everybody a COVID check? So I'm going to say this in closing, guys. This is, this is beautiful. Um, thank you for coming out. I just want to do... <laughs> thank you. Walk away with your head held high. Don't argue with anybody. You know who you are. Stick tight with your people. Peace, love, and reparations. One more time. Peace, love, and reparations. Give it up for Miss Connie Collins. Awesome, awesome. Coming to the stage, we have our brother, the visionary for the Foundation of Black America.
checking for me, no one checking on me So I had to go run up and check I got a message on me, ain't no flexing on me My attorney gon' call and collect Blessings on blessings for me, my success is only made them envious, they got upset I had to put all their egos in check I want the money to pass the home of Frederick Douglass. DC, the home of Dick Gregory. The home of Marion Barry. The home of Dave Chappelle. The home of Mambo Sauce. What y'all putting in that Mambo Sauce? DC, we're here. The rally for reparations. Look at this beautiful crowd. Give yourselves a round of applause. Now family, it's a couple of days before midterms. We're letting the political structure know we want tangibles as foundational black Americans. And we're not going to let them redefine what reparations mean, right? Is reparations student loan debt? Is reparations HBCU funding? No. Is reparations minority business loans? No. Is reparations catfish nuggets? No. What's reparations? Money! What's reparations? Money! What's reparations? Money! Give yourselves a round of applause. Now family, when we talk about reparations, we get the same seven rebuttals from the dominant society, and we need to know how to address their rebuttals when we talk about what we need to get as far as reparations. The first thing that they say is, well, wouldn't reparations be divisive? Wouldn't that make people in the dominant society not like you? Are you here to be liked by the dominant society? Tina Turner told us, what's love got to do with it? We're trying to get our money. We're already divided, but they control our resources. So we want them to divide our money and give it back to us because we are owed a debt as foundational black Americans. The second thing that they try to tell us is, well, other people suffered. It just wasn't black people. Irish people were enslaved. Italian people were lynched. Native Americans were mistreated and they're not complaining, so why are you blacks complaining? Well, the thing is, these people are not complaining because they were compensated. The Irish, who were indentured servants, they got something called freedom dues after their contract ran out. They got money, land, and weapons. They were compensated, then they were brought into white society to join all the benefits and reap all the gains of being white. When the Italians were lynched down in New Orleans, there was a situation where there was a mass lynching of Italians. Their families were compensated, and the country of Italy was compensated, and the Italians were allowed into white society to reap the benefits. The Native Americans, we know the red ones, they were compensated. They got broke off all types of money, and many of them enslaved us as well, so they need to be cutting a check too. The third rebuttal that they have for us is, well, if you want to get reparations, FBAs, why don't you go to the Africans who sold you? you. Have y'all heard that one? Yeah. Well, I say to that, number one, the African who sold us, well, he got a one-off. Number two, those countries don't exist no more. Those countries over there were colonized and they were absorbed into the white European power structure, so all of their resources were drained. So they need to get the resources from the white power structure in Europe that dominated them, while we're getting money from the white power structure that dominated us, the United States government. Another rebuttal they say, well, all white people didn't even own slaves during slavery. So how are white people responsible? We didn't all own slaves. But it was a slave economy where everybody benefited from the slave economy. So if you were a white person in the 1800s working for the train station, the train station economy was built on the resources that were taken back and forth from the south to the north. So you owe. 
If you work for an insurance company in the 1800s, yeah, you didn't own a slave, but you were insuring slaves and you were making money off slavery. If you were a white person in the 1800s working for a bank or a factory, you were getting all the raw materials and refining it in those northern factories, benefiting from slavery. So the whole economy was based on the labor of our foundational black American ancestors. The next rebuttal is, well, my family came over after the Civil War. So I wasn't even here during slavery. So how do I owe? When your family was over there in the slums of Europe, they heard about a country that was built up off the wealth from the free labor of our ancestors. And they knew that that wealth was mass distributed from our hands into white society and locked in racially and they sat over there in Europe and said sign me up I want to go over there and be a part of that so since you want to be a part of it you're part of the debt and you owe too the sixth one they say is well there's already been reparations paid to black people welfare and affirmative action Number one, welfare was created for white women in the 1930s. Number two, most welfare recipients in America are white people in middle America. The welfare capital is Owsley County, Kentucky, where 99% of the people are white and on welfare. That's the welfare capital. And as far as affirmative action, we know that affirmative action benefits white women more than anybody. So is affirmative action reparations? No. Exactly. And the last thing they say, family, they say, well, listen, why should I, as a good white person, be on the hook for something that I didn't do? Why should my tax dollars pay for something that I didn't do? I didn't own a slave. Did any of you remove red Native Americans from their land? Your tax dollars go to pay for them now. Did any of you put people in concentration camps in Germany? Your tax dollars go to pay off some of the victims of the Holocaust. Did any of you put Japanese Americans in internment camps in World War II? But your tax dollars go to pay the Japanese families. Did anybody here fly a plane in the World Trade Center? You know some of your tax dollars go to those victims too. Did you create a war in Afghanistan? No. Billions of your tax dollars go to the Afghanistanian people. No. Did you cause a war in the Ukraine? No. Billions of your tax dollars go to the Ukrainian citizens. No. So since we're giving all of our tax dollars to these people who are not even citizens for the most part, we're going to make sure the real compensation and the real check is going to be cut for the people who deserved it, who built this country from the ground up, who cultivated the culture in this country. Foundation of Black Americans, ladies and gentlemen. Say reparations! reparations. FBA! FBA. Uh, give yourselves a round of applause. Now, family, coming to the stage. Our next guest, this is a brother you all know and love. He's a mainstay in our Hidden Color series films. This is a master teacher who I love and respect so much from New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for brother Kaba. Kaba First, may I say thank you for your time. As you mature, one of the things you come to realize, the most valuable thing you have is time. And everything that we're doing right now in our time is for a future time. It's for our children. And the theme I'd like to talk about is where do we want to see our children in the year November 5th, 21-22? What do we want them to have in a hundred years? Everything. Everything. 
it's important that we understand this family to help us understand what we have done to make this possible. There are reparations all around the world. In Africa, they have a 10, they have a 10 point plan in Africa for the colonialism of what they've experienced. In the Caribbean, in CARICOM, they have a 10 point plan as to what happened to them in the Caribbean. For those of us who understand what happened when Africa was carved up in 1885 at the Berlin Conference, we understand what happened. England, and France, and Germany, and other countries of Europe carved up Africa and stole all of their resources and colonized them. In the Caribbean, they built up Europe. And here in the United States of America, Africans stolen from Africa built up this country. The hands that built the pyramids built the White House. I'm talking history. It's important for us to understand they're not giving us anything. We are just claiming what has been ours from the beginning. Not to mention the fact that the original indigenous people were black. Say it again. The folk that we know of today with due respect, they are the fifth migration That's right. of humans that came to this part of the That's world. Right. We were the first. The short stature, Twa and Booty people came here. Yes, sir. Yes. And they people this land. They are derogatorily called pygmies. But they are the original family of our world. They introduced the entire concept of Ma'at, justice and peace. They came here, and then came a second wave, who was called the Clovis Folsom. They were black. And then the third, the Algonquin. They were also black. Then came the Inuit, derogatorily called Eskimo. And then came who we call the Asian invaders. And they came in such large numbers escaping Genghis Khan yes. that they then took over the gene pool of this country. Yes, they did. So what was once black became red. This is history, family. There's evidence. See, I'm not into truth. Uh, I'm not really into truth because truth can change. Because yesterday could have been a very cold day. And that's the truth. And it's a fact. But today, the sunshine, we in t-shirts. That's the truth, and that's a fact. So it's the evidence that you have to go by. Because it's the science, the knowledge, the wisdom of who we are as a people that will help us understand. When we're dealing with these issues, there are certain issues that are not to be argued. I'm not arguing whether or not we deserve reparations. We deserve reparations, and we're going to get it by any means necessary. And while we're talking about any means necessary, let's talk about security. You can have the world in your hands, but if you cannot secure it, if you cannot protect it, you don't have it. You're just holding it until someone stronger than you come along and take it. You got to protect what you have. You have to secure what you have. So even if they give you reparations, you got to be able to protect it. You got to be able to secure it. And we have that possibility. Because what we have to understand, family, looking at this from a global perspective, they stole Africans and brought them here. Now, reparations. And when they brought us here, they enslaved us and made us work against our will. 
We built this country. We built the machines. We could not, because we were enslaved, we could not claim it, we could not have a patent on it, but we created them. And they got credit for it. Because who better to create the machines that's going to help what you do than the people that are working? That's the evidence. If you're in the big house and I'm down in the, uh, in, in, in the field, who's going to build the machines? It's the people in the field. That's right. And that's what we did. The inventors. And down south, what was going on at the time is that the south was getting big money on the raw materials. And the North was having problems because they were the industry. That's where the actual factories, most of the factories were made, where the South had the raw materials. And pretty soon the South said, well, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't like this relationship, this 13 colony thing. And so they created what's called the Mason-Dixon line. And in creating the Mason-Dixon line, what they did was say, well, that's the North and we're the South. And the North began to put pressure on them because something happened, family. It's called capitalism. Capitalism is fueled by competition. And if you could buy a human for $300, or you would pay somebody 30 years, $300 a year, which would you choose if you are profit motivated? You would pick buying somebody for $300 one time. And so the North said, but you got to stop enslaving people. They said, we, why are we going to do that? They said, because we got to work together. And the South said, well, who need to work with you? I'm going to break away. The North said, you can't do that. The South said, why not? Because then I would break up the Union. Abraham Lincoln said it. He said, if I could keep Africans enslaved and preserve the Union, I would. That's evidence, he said it. And so the South said, but we're gonna keep enslaving people. But you see what happened is that they had to stop the enslavement of the transatlantic enslavement. Now I know they tell you that they felt sorry, that they wanted to repair the damage. That's not why they did it. They did it because they gave so many guns to African people in Africa who were on their side, unfortunately. But we got some people on their side right now, so we shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> we have to face the truth now. And what began to happen is that Africans began to fight the Europeans, and they could not enslave the way they used to. So they had to stop the enslavement process because they were losing money. And so what they decided to do was to now, they would breed the Africans in the United States. And that's how they were able to build up their enslavement, the Africans that were here, by breeding them and creating breeding farms. There's evidence and there are books on this. And then the South said, but we're not going to do that. We're not going to free our Africans. The North said you have to. So in the year 18, check this out family. In the year 1854, a man by the name of George L. W. Bickley, don't believe a word I say, Google this. George L. W. Bickley in Cincinnati, Ohio, decided that he was gonna create an organization. And the people that were part of the organization were called the Knights of the Golden Circle. And what they decided to do was from the Mason-Dixon line, they were gonna go down into Mexico. They were gonna go to Nicaragua. They were gonna go to Cuba. They were gonna make Havana, Cuba, the capital of the Golden Circle, where they were going to enslave Africans keep enslavement going and cut themselves off from the North. And the North said, you can't do that. And the South said, yes, we can. And not only that, I'm tired of talking to you. We're gonna do it. And that 
is why the Civil War happened. They weren't freeing African people. They were preserving capitalism and the Union. Is evidence. And they were going to create a new United States. But it was going to include the southern part of the United States, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. And Havana, Cuba was going to become its capital. But listen to this. Check out the movie National Treasure, Book of Secrets. They'll tell you about it. It's of course fiction, but it still tells you about the Golden Knights. If you went to comic books, get Atomic Robo. Edition number 28, it deals with the Golden Knights. They were involved in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. They were directly involved with the assassinations. Reparations is what we are going to get for all the work that our ancestors did. And when we get that reparations, we're going to do it in the name of our children who are yet to be born because they are the best and they come from the best and only the best of the best could have survived. You are the best of the best. Our children are the best of the best of the best. And we're going to get that reparations. And if not now, then when? And if not us, then who? It's going to be now, and it's going to be us. And this is a continuation. So as I leave the stage, I pay homage to our sister, Queen Mother Moore, who years ago talked about reparations in Harlem. I heard her. I pay homage to INCOBRA, the organization formed in 1989 to fight for reparations. No more games. It's time, family. Reparations now. Can I hear you say it? Reparations now! Reparations when? Now! Who? Now! Now! now. Hotel. Give it up for Dr. Kaba! <laughs> You guys having a good, good time? Y'all yeah. good in the back? Yeah. Coming to the stage now, ladies and gentlemen, one of my good partners, financial expert, the creator of Your Black World News. You already know. Ladies and gentlemen, give a nice warm round of applause to my good brother, Dr. Boyce Watkins. sick of it. You, you shouldn't be apologizing to people who should be apologizing to you. Not at all. Now I was thinking about this. I was, I was, I had, I had some interesting conversations when we had the All Black National Convention on, on Friday night. Um, I got, I got a call from a, a brother named, named Kanye West. And, and we talked for a while, and we were kind of, I was kind of dissecting what's happening to him. I was, we were sort of breaking down, uh, and, I, and I think he was listening, I was explaining, look, this is what you're dealing with. This is not a matter of right or wrong. 
When you talk about something like reparations, this ain't a matter of right or wrong. In fact, everybody raise your hand if you know that we deserve reparations. Like, th this is not, this, this ain't calculus. This is not, it's not something we have to prove. Dr. Claude Anderson wrote a book called Black Labor, White Wealth that explains why we deserve reparations. So when, when Ye and I were talking, because his name is Ye now or something, they, the rappers, they changed their names and stuff. I said, this ain't about like whether you're right or wrong. This ain't about whether those people should be doing what they're doing to you. This is a power game. Yes, it is. And when you play the game of power, right and wrong goes out the window. Right. True or false goes out the window. The whole pandemic, we had people telling us what was true when we had other people who said that's false. And they were muted. Because you're playing a game of power. So at the end of the day, just to finish the part about, yeah, 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 celebrities are not important, but I want to make this point. I said, basically what they're doing is they have put an economic embargo on you. They have declared economic warfare against you. They're doing to you pretty much what they tried to do to every black man, woman, and child for the last 400 years. So the same way Kanye or Kyrie or whoever the celebrity is can't do what they want to do because of the economic consequences, a lot of us feel the same thing because we get up and we go to work every day working for people who don't like us very much. This is a common thing. So let's get back to that word power. Power is defined in the book Poweronomics as the ability to pursue your agenda despite the opposition of others. Power is not the ability to do what you want if, if white people will allow it. Power is not the, the ability to do what you want if, if everybody helps you. Power doesn't mean that you have allies that are going to get you there. Power is the ability to pursue your agenda despite the opposition of others. Say that. So we are going to run into other groups that are going to attempt to use their power to mute the truth and keep you from getting what you want. So I talked to Tariq backstage. I said, tell me about the resistance that you're getting for this rally, because I know they're going to resist you. I know they're going to fight you. He said, yeah, there's been a lot of pushback. I said, absolutely. That's because you're doing something effective. The only black people who get no resistance are the ones who have submitted to the system. Weak ass men don't get resistance. The punks don't get resistance. Most of your celebrities are punks. That's a fact. So the power, the power in the community is not on TV. It's not in your favorite rapper. It's not, it's not with your favorite actor. The power is right here in this space. This is where black power lives. This is where the work is going to get done. So out of tribute to a man I love like a father by the name of Dr. Claude Anderson. He, li he lives not far from here. And just to tell you how effective he is, he's lived down the street from Howard University for, for decades. They've never had him come speak. They've had a long list of anti-black people speak, a whole lot of weak Negroes from Hollywood speak. But for some reason, the greatest economic thinker of our generation, it just he just slips off the radar. That tells you what you're up against. That's telling you what you have to fight. So let me give you something that will help you in this battle. I'm going to give you three core values that I believe in. This is not a solution that's going to come from the politicians. It's not a solution that's going to come from the celebrities. It's a solution that comes from us and our families. Black people have to do three things. 
We must educate our own children because the public school is killing them at an early age. Our public schools are nothing but prisons on training wheels, and they're training our kids to become little white supremacists. Second thing we must do after we educate our own children, we must create our own jobs. A lot of our people cannot be free because you cannot expect to fight a power and beg them for resources at the same time. The man who feeds my family, I can't look at him and say, I'm the man of this house. He's the man of the house. So we have to create our own jobs so we don't send our kids across town begging for a job from people who hate them. The third thing we must do is we must support black businesses by any means necessary. Black people, you are not poor. You are not broke. Black people have 1.6 trillion in spending power. That exceeds the gross domestic product of Russia, Mexico, Saudi Arabia. We're tied with Canada. How in the hell can you have a spending amount that matches the GDP of Canada and call yourselves poor? So you don't have a lack of resources. You have a lack of planning, a lack of mindset, a lack of focus. Everything that we need, we've already got. So as we move forward with this reparations fight, and we should move forward with intentionality, I am not here to tell you what to do, but whenever a politician calls me, I tell them, if you can't support reparations, then I cannot support you. No reparations, no vote. 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 Thank you very much. No vote. Thank you all very much. That's all I got to say. God bless you. Are we still good, guys? We good on this side? We good over here? All right, now coming to the stage, we have one of our DMV sisters. She was in a couple of my movies. She's in the new movie that we have coming out called American Maroon, coming out in a couple of months. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Dr. Maya. Give it up for Dr. Maya. For we are our ancestors and we stand on their shoulders. Ashe, love and honor and gratitude to Brother Tariq Nasheed. Let's give it up for Brother Tariq Nasheed. And all of the grassroots organizations for raising awareness around the issue of reparations for foundational black Americans and for mobilizing our people to demand what is rightfully ours. But before I give my spill, I gotta address the elephant in the room. I gotta address the elephant in the room. FBA is not a hate group. FBA is a lineage. FBA is a lineage that we are proud of and that we will protect and advocate for. So to my brothers and sisters on the continent and throughout the diaspora, FBA is no different from you recognizing your Yoruba lineage, or your Ashanti lineage, or your Akan lineage, or your Bamaliki lineage. And so if you truly are our brothers and sisters, then you will support us in aligning yourselves with us instead of aligning yourself with the dominant society when you come over here. Dr. Sandy Darity, in his book, in his book, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century, he defines reparations as a program of acknowledgement, redress, and closure for grievous injustices. So reparations isn't a handout. It is given to rectify harm. And although all 
other groups have received reparations for the harm done to them, when we demand reparations, the dominant society frames the demand as if we are asking for a handout from the federal government. Well, so-called whites have been, have been given, I'm sorry, family, so-called whites have been given handouts since the human category was invented after the Bacon Rebellion in 1676. See, whiteness is an invention. There's no such thing as a white person. And after the Bacon Rebellion, this government passed a package of laws that gave psychological and material value that to, to those who were classified as white. And these laws gave patriarchal authority to white men. It gave power to white men. And it disempowered people who were classified as non-whites. In Dr. Amos Wilson's book, Blueprint for Black Power, how many of you had Blueprint for Black Power? Blueprint for Black Power by Dr. Amos Wilson, that book should be in every black home. In that particular book on page, I believe it was 34 or 36, he lists all of the handouts that whites have been given from 1675 to 1975. White people have been given handouts for 300 years plus. All right, and so from 1683 oh, to 1889, the federal government passed acts and ordinances that gave lands to whites. Specifically, the Homestead Act, yeah. which was passed in 1862, it granted settlers 160 acre tracts of federal lands without charges. Over 250 acres of public lands were transferred almost exclusively to whites in the most important land program in American history. In the book, The Hidden Cost of Being African American by Thomas Shapiro, we learn that over a million whites today still live off of the wealth that they incurred from the Homestead Act alone. From 1920 to 1975, our federal government, they passed the Mineral Leasing Act, which authorized the federal government to lease public land for the exploration of gas, oil, and other minerals. In 1926, they passed the Federal Air Commerce Act, where they gave licenses to qualified aviators. So you wonder why we don't have black-owned airlines. Your government made sure we didn't have black-owned airlines. All right, and the, the Federal Commission, I'm sorry, Federal Communication Commission, they issued the first licenses for television broadcast stations, and no grants were made to Negroes. See, this is just Dr. Uh, Amos Wilson's language. He says Negroes until token awards in the late 1960s and 1980s. So, family, you wonder why we don't have black old television networks, because your government designed it to be that way. And so... Dr. Amos Wilson's list does not include the New Deal policies that were passed under the Roosevelt administration, right? I'm talking about the FHA loans and the, and the VA loans, which created a white middle class. All right? And so while they were creating a white middle class, we were confined to ghettos. We were redlined and confined to ghettos. Ghettos are a government creation. And so this government has been complicit in putting us at the bottom of the dominant hierarchy. So it is the government that needs to fix this problem. I say, man, we were enslaved. I mean, there's so many receipts, family. I mean, we could talk about enslavement, how we grew cash crops, you know, sugar, rice, cotton, and tobacco, which led to the growth and expansion of America. We fought in all of the wars. Hell, we helped white folks win their independence while we were still over here fighting for ours. We suffered numerous massacres. I know they like to shine a light on Tulsa, Oklahoma, but there were hundreds of black communities that they destroyed, which destroyed black lives black poverty, I'm sorry, black properties, black businesses, and black wealth. All right, and so some people may say, well, Dr. Ma'a, well, what about today? Well, let's bring it up to today. They've murdered and falsely imprisoned our freedom fighters, free movement. Let me hear y'all say free movement, all political prisoners. Free 
Honorable Mayor and all political prisoners. Ashe. Mass incarceration, police violence and killings, discrimination in housing and employment and credit markets, poorly resourced schools. All of these things, these laws, policies and practices created a racial hierarchy that has placed so-called whites at the top and FBA at the bottom. We have been locked out of the American dream that they tell us it's so easy to get. Isn't that what America does? They project this image to the world. Just come to America and anybody can achieve the American Greek dream while they lock foundational black Americans out and we are the people who built America. But no more, family, no more. We will no longer beg for a seat at their table. We're gonna build our own goddamn table. Just cut the check. Let me hear you say, cut the check. Cut the, Cut the check. Cut the check. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, we are coming to get our check. And this time, it better not, it better not come back insufficient funds. It better not come back insufficient funds. And FBA, never mind the naysayers, FBA. Never mind the detractors. You just keep your eyes on the prize. You hear me? And we will be victorious. Ask me, how do I know? Say it louder. How do you know, Dr. Ma? Because our ancestors said so. You remember when Dr. King said he went to the mountaintop and he saw that promised land? Our ancestors said so. So I want to hear you say, we will win. We will win. We will win. We will win. Just keep the faith, family. Keep the fight. Black power. Hey, what's up? We still out here, I think, five hours now at this point. Um, I'm here with one of my favorites. If y'all don't know him, Google him. Sport, Spoken Reasons. How you doing? Good. How have you been? I've been all right. I'm hot, but, but, but I'm, I'm blessed to be here, though. I'm super shocked because I've known him for years, and I'm super surprised to see him down here. What made you say, I have to be at this rally? Um, it's history in the making. I mean, I didn't, I didn't want to miss out. You know, I don't, I don't know when we, when we gonna actually get this check, but I know at the same time, I gotta be a part of everything. So, uh, I, you know, I want to be able to tell my kids and tell my, you know, uh, my family that, you know, I was actually here for it. So I was fighting in the cause. I actually, you know, using my legs to walk. So I'm here. So why do you think that foundational Black Americans? Why do you think it's so hard? for us to get reparations. And they've given it to every other group. Why don't they want to give it to us specifically? Because we have all the power. We have all the power. We have, um, you know, um, they didn't steal from us from, from nothing, you know, for nothing. So, um, you know, you give us a check, then see what we do with it. Okay, so I have a couple questions for you. Okay, no problem. Why do you think that foundational black Americans deserve reparations? Okay, I have like a number of list of things, but I'm gonna numerize it down to a little bit. I'm gonna minimize it. I believe that we, we, we basically we earned it. And like I said before, I don't feel like this is something that we need to earn. I feel like this should just come natural to us because we have built the country. And a lot of people get that confused. You know, it's like, oh, you came later. You're not foundational, foundational Black American. But we are FBA, foundational, the most important part. We were here first, and that part I feel like is the most important part you know so I feel like that is a very 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 big part you know oh. we really deserve that we really deserve that because it is ours and I feel like we honestly we deserve land we deserve money we deserve everything and I feel like they should be paying us like when you get like foreigners and stuff like that and I like to visit to other places too so I'm not saying don't come here I'm just saying pay us guarantee of non-repetition so I think we're ready to bring up our next speaker. This is an elder, an esteemed elder. Give it up for Baba James Swall. FBA, do you understand who you are? Then stop being afraid of anybody that tried to encroach on you. Secret to life is to have no fear. It was Malcolm that told us that. 
reparation isn't a question. We're going to get it because we're going to take it. But it's your method. And so it's a legal question in the world. But how many people in here ever had a job or got a business? Raise your hand. You do it to get paid, right? So if somebody works your ass for 400 years and don't pay you, don't they owe you? Let me think of it now. Somebody worked you for 400 years. Don't they owe you? And don't that come with back pay? Don't that come with interest? Isn't that yours? See, some people try to make us feel bad for asking. Some of our own, too, for reparations. This isn't a question of asking anybody for anything. We're telling somebody, you forced me to render a service you didn't pay for. In the process, you murdered nearly 50 million of my kind. You owe me. I'm not asking you for anything. Dr. Asa Hilliard said, and I want to get this one straight, because I know a lot of us have been speaking on identity. If you don't get identity straight, you don't have a case. Okay? So foundation, I'm an African American, that's not a contradiction. But I'm also a foundation of black American. That's not a contradiction. You understand? If someone is from Ghana and he migrates here, he's not a foundational black American. But I want you to hold up because I heard some stuff I didn't like. That's still your family, he just got another case. Many, I've had cases, I've been in that precinct, I've been in that jail cell, and I know how you get a case. People have different cases. America committed a crime against people all over the world and they got cases, but they don't have our case. We got a particular case, but I want you to be clear. I'm not giving up Africa. Now, if some of y'all want to give up the richest piece of real estate on earth, do it. But I'm not doing it and I'm not going to advise you to do it. That's yours, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a nation here called the United States of America that we built. We didn't just build it with labor. We built it with our intellect. We built it with our science. We built it with our technology. We built it with our spirituality. And we are still doing it. And we want it back. Let me tell you a little secret. People play games on your mind and it make you think you're weak and then when you think you're weak, you take a certain posture when it's time to fight. When you break down the ethnic groups in America, the largest ethnic group according to their tallies is the Germans. The second largest ethnic group is the, let me get it right, the foundational black Americans. Now I want you to understand this because I'm going to show you something. The foundation of black Americans, according to the stats done by this criminal enterprise called the government, right, is second only to the German in population size in America. But the big lie is we are the only people whose immigrant population, whether they're making mistakes or not, we'll deal with that before I'm finished, is not counted as their population. Italians is counted as Italians, no matter when they got here. Greeks are counted as Greeks, no matter when they got here. Chinese is counted as Chinese, no matter when they got here. But they don't do that for foundation of black Americans. If they did that, the African Latino, who is not even treated kindly by the white Latino, is still counted as white folks and isolated from us, if we just took the African Latino into the family, we'd be the largest ethnic group in America. I'm trying to tell you something now, how you get played out of pocket and then you're fighting out of the wrong pocket. The foundation of black American is the largest population in America. And when you talk about ethnic population wealth, you're the first or second wealthiest ethnic population in America. But if you don't get clear on your identity, 
you don't know how to take your riches and turn your riches into wealth. Because all the criminals that make up this government, the black ones, the white ones, and the brown ones, that have not voted for our reparations, we should use the mechanism of how you get to get in office to get the criminals out of office. But we don't know how to use all the tools at our hands. Some of the secret about voting, voting is a tool. It's not an addiction. It's not a disease. It is a tool when you live in a capitalist society that uses electoral processes to pick your leaders. Now, if you're going to sit back and let somebody else use that tool, you're going to lose the game. If you want to win the game, you better take control of every tool mechanism you got. But the first one is your identity. Power is the ability to define your reality, and that includes your identity, and everyone else should respect your decision on how you define yourself as foundation of black America. So me, I'm not gonna say I'm not an African American, because Africa is my race, America is a geopolitical place. But foundation of black American is an ethnic statement. It talks about a population for the last 400 years that have been under duress in the United States of America, and we come from all over Africa, and we formed our own ethnic nation. And you have to know how to identify your ethnic nation if you're going to be able to fight for them. Yes, my brother from Nigeria, he got a case against Britain, and he's probably got a case against America, but not the same case we got. All right? Now, I'm not going to argue with him. That's my brother. I'm going to fight for my case and ask for his assistance and then when he fights for his case, I'm going to give him my assistance. Because this war is a race war and it has been a race war for the last 3,000 years. The last 3,000 years you have been in a race war. This population, the foundation of black Americans, for 400 years, we have taken on the mightiest white empire ever built ever on built. earth. And we have defeated them multiple times at the game. You understand? So when we tell them we're coming to the table to get our reparations, we're coming to the table not to ask him for our reparations. We are going to define methodologies for taking our reparations because it isn't just a conversation it isn't just us being here talking today every one of you have to engage with foundation of black american and organizing the mechanism necessary to take our reparations and understand reparations is the pretty name about the for the money they owe us okay we can throw that word out we're going to take the money they owe us Back in the 60s, we called it reclamation. We robbed the bank here and a store here and a few things. And some of us did get away. Some went to jail. Some of us did get away. We call it reclamation. You know? So we have to reclaim what is ours. And we have to be clear. Don't be ashamed of your identity. You're a foundation of black American, and you're also African. Africa is not a place. That is our ancestral, historical, spiritual center. When we came before Columbus, we came from Africa. When we came with the Mali Empire, we came from Africa. When we came on the slave ship, we came from Africa. Then all of us married together. I'm Native American, Chikora tribe, and African. I came on the ships with the Malians before Columbus, and I'm still African, and I'm here talking to you. I'm from South Carolina, the Gullah Geechee culture, Chikora nation. Right? I'm, I'm straight up foundation of black America because I got all the elements but I'm not going to give nobody Africa but guess what America is as much mine as Africa is I bought this I bought this I paid blood for this I paid labor for this and I want to control this and we are going to control this don't be afraid White people across the planet is at minus birth rate. Not zero birth rate. They're at minus birth rate, meaning they cannot have enough babies 
to keep up with the natural death process. So that's what the LGBT thing is about. That's what, let me, uh, no disrespect of a brother or sister in that, they got to deal with that. That's what they got to deal with. But I got to deal with the politics of it, okay? That's what that whole thing of intermarriage, you saw how the intermarriage thing has souped up? That's what that's about. Trying to now supplant your gene into their gene, hoping that they can survive. But they're not going to survive. But most of us here will not live to see their death. But we know their death is going to come. But what we can do is make sure we make the case for reparations now. And like that dude was talking about segregation, we want reparations now. We want reparations tomorrow. We want reparations forever because we're going to take the whole damn country. Every time. Okay? So we just want to be clear. Don't give up being an African. That's yours too. I want that gold and that diamond. I'm not about to give that to nobody. I want the platinum and the tungsten and the colton. I want, that's mine. I'm not giving that up. But I want this too. I want this because I built it. I want this because I raised it up. I want this because if you look at all the major inventions in this country, we did it, not them. They took it, but we made it. We invented that light bulb, not them. We invented the cell phone, not them. We invented the computer, not them. And you can go on and on and on. Take our technology out, they die. That's a part of your reparations. They stole all your patents. They stole all your technology. They even stole your hip-hop rap music, made trillions of dollars of it, and when somebody stand up like Kanye, they try to shut them down. And so I spoke up for Kanye a couple of weeks ago and tell them, I'm not going to let them shut him down. And you shouldn't let them shut him down. Foundation of Black America, be proud of your identity, all of your identity. If I went to Africa, I would meet a Yoruba man. And he would be a Yoruba man and proud of that. He would be a Nigerian and proud of that. He would be from Benin State and proud of that, and he'd be an African and proud of that. So don't let nobody limit your identity. You're an African. You're an African-American. You're a foundation of black American, and you are some more stuff. Own your identity. Shackle yourself to your identity, and then make your case for reparations, 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 reparations now. Peace and love. statistics to you. Between 1910 to 1997, we have had stolen 16 to 19 million acres. We are now left down to 10% and dwindling. Okay? 19% of black families have a negative net worth. That's 3.5 million black families that are so impoverished that even if you were to give them money, it will not bring them out of poverty. It will just be to try to get them out the hole. An additional 4.5 million black families have less than $10,000 a year in disposable income, okay? Right now as we speak, COVID-19 came along and wiped out 50% of black businesses. But before COVID-19, we were slated as a community to head to zero wealth. COVID has come along and accelerated that. So when you look at this data, I ask, where are our allies? I mean, I'm sure some of them are here, but where are they? And then I ask, where are our leaders? I don't know where they are, but I know where they should be, and they should be right here. 
right here with us. Exactly. And then you look at these politicians with their six-figure salaries. Now, the Republicans, okay, they suck. I don't know who's responsible for them keeping their job, but I know who's responsible for the Democrats, and I call them Democrats because they feed off of us while doing nothing for us. That's right. Guess who's responsible for them keeping their jobs? We are. We are. For the past 60 years, the Democrats have existed off of the black vote. They will not exist without us. And yet we are heading to the point of economic and political extinction because of them. Now, when these issues are brought up, they come to us with excuses. When we say reparations is owed to descendants of American slaves, the people whose ancestors were promised but never received their 40 acres in a mule, they start what Tariq Nasheed says, splaining. They start to say, well, you know, we can't do any policies for you based on race. That's one excuse they like to say. Don't fall for it. Reparations is not done based on race. Reparations is done based on lineage and political status. Now, let me give you some examples. The Catawba Native Americans in South Carolina, a tribe that was formerly enslavers, they just received 20 acres of land. 911 families, people who are family members, descendants of those killed during the 9-11 attacks, they get resources from the government. Illegal immigrants right now as we speak receive billions of dollars from the government to clothe and feed for them. One estimate say they spend as much as $8 million a day feeding and clothing illegal immigrants. Ukrainians are receiving, have received $60 billion, and as of yesterday, they've given them another $400 million. So when they tell us we can't, they can't do anything specific for us, do not fall for it. They do things specifically for everyone else, and right now as we speak, they're making more promises to other groups. If you have a child, and your child decides, a child decides that he or she wants to be a she or a he, the Democrats are saying, hey, we can do that. Right now, our country has taken in over five million illegal immigrants since the start of this administration. That's putting a strain on resources on the state level, the municipal level, and the federal level. But the Democrats will say, hey, that's good. We can take them too. The Democrats will say that abortion is a black issue, that there should be nothing more important to us than aborting our beautiful black children. Exactly. And they have sworn to protect women's rights. But who the hell is protecting FBA's rights? Exactly. They say they can't do anything specific for us, but this nation has done specific policies against us for centuries, okay? Shadow slavery was done specifically to us on the municipal level, the state level, but even the federal level. The Fugitive Slave Act, the Dred Scott decision, okay? After slavery, we had Jim Crow, we had redlining. When slavery ended, we were not just free, but as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we was free to hunger and famine and terrorism. Our black Wall Streets that we managed to build from nothing burnt to the ground. Now, I was in a conversation with someone who is from Haiti, and I love Haiti, a beautiful country. I visit there, and I have nothing against Haiti. But he was talking about how his fam, his parents, grandparents came here, and from nothing, they were able to achieve a middle-class life. And I said to him, should I be impressed? My people from nothing built not just one, not just two, not just three, four, five, but over 50 black Wall Streets. I've never seen any other group do that. Give it up for our people. Give it up for our people. Give it up for our people. Yeah. So, this country, again, 
has done policies specifically against us, but when it's time for them to repair the specific wrongs they've done to us, now they want to tell us they don't see color. Now they want to tell us that we're all human beings. I don't give a damn what you see or don't see, but I know what I see. I see my people suffering every single day, and I'm sick of it. Sick of it. Now, I want to address some things here. We do have an issue in our community with people believing that the answer lies in us building an economic base. And who can argue against that? We do need to build the economic base. I support black businesses. I support group economics. But don't let anyone tell you that the government is not the answer, okay? When white America was filled with poverty and homelessness, do you know what this government did? In 1861, Abraham Lincoln signed the Homestead Act. They gave away almost 300 million acres of land to European immigrants, to white Americans, some who were former Confederates that fought against the nation. They gave them land while giving black Americans nothing but poverty, okay? $10 trillion given primarily to white Americans. When World War I ended and millions of veterans returned from overseas, there were plenty of white veterans that were impoverished and on the streets. When World War II started, the president at that time, Roosevelt, said, we cannot have a repeat of that. So do you know what they did? The GI Bill that gave over $2 trillion to roughly 16 million white Americans, allowing them to become homeowners, allowing them to go to school, allowing them to get a pension. They did the Social Security Act. They did the Labor Union Act. There is no group in this country that has ever gotten the wealth they've had because they simply pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. Okay? Don't let them tell you they have. No. Japanese Americans are one of the richest demographics in our nation. They got reparations. Chinese Americans, when they first started coming here en masse, they came to finish the railroads that our people had already largely built. Remember that. But not only they were paid for their labor, but not only were they paid for their labor, they were giving land, which today are the Chinatowns. So, at that same time, we were getting land taken from us. The number one cause of lynch mobs was not false accusations against a black man. It was black land theft, okay? Always remember that. So when someone comes to us and they say the government is not the answer, tell them to shut their damn mouths, okay? The government is the answer. And when it comes to descendants of American slaves, Freeman, which is our congressional term, or foundational black America, which is a social term, when it comes to us, now, the government better be the answer because they sure as hell have been the problem. Now, we cannot and we will not accept any excuses from any politician. The Democrats will have you believe that if you vote for the Republicans, because I'm not a fan of either one, that our hope of reparations is never going to happen. Well, I say for the past 60 years, we've been voting for the Democrats. Y'all seen reparations happen yet? Okay. The answer is not to feel enslaved to any party. The answer is not to feel beholden to any party. The answer is to feel beholden to policy. Okay? Say it with me. Policy always Party never. Say it with me. Policy always. Party never. Now, when we go to the Democrats and we say, hey, our people are suffering, our people are hurting, they don't like to say, well, what about the Republicans? You ask the Republicans? That was really interesting to me. You tell us the Republicans are bad. We believe you. You tell us that the Republicans won't do anything for us, and we believe you. And then we vote for you. But then we go to you to hold you accountable for our votes. You say to us, why don't you go to the Republicans? Because you just told us not to. If I go to McDonald's and I get a Big Mac, 
and my Big Mac is undercooked. What the hell do I look like going across the street to Burger King? You see, the party that gets the vote is the party that gets the smoke. Remember that. Now. 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 You see, you're not going to have it both ways. You're not going to have it both ways where you get the vote, but you don't want to get the accountability. Okay? Also, let's deal with another lie. I heard Tariq and I heard a few people up here shut down some myths and rebuttals against reparations. But there's one that people like to say, well, we can't afford that. Let me explain something to you. If you borrow $50 from me and you say you want to pay me next week, and I come to you to get my $50, is it my responsibility to figure out how you are going to pay? No. That's your problem. Okay? But the good news is, the good news is, the United States of America is what we call a monetary sovereign, meaning they can generate as much currency as they need. Don't ever believe this government has no money. The America can never run out of money. The only thing that limits what America can spend is inflation. But even with that, check this out. People like to say if you put too much money into the economy, you'll cause hyperinflation. That is historically inaccurate. I'm going to give y'all three examples of when this government has spent the most money. Number one, the New Deal. Roosevelt spent trillions of dollars to provide jobs for struggling Americans to avert homelessness. And guess what it did? It saved the American economy and brought us out of the Great Depression. Number two. When President Obama got in office and we was going through the Great Recession, this government spent $29 trillion to bring our economy from the brink of another depression. Number three, this was more recent. When the COVID-19 came, Donald Trump spent over $3 trillion. You know what I didn't hear anyone say? No one asked, what about the debt? No one asked what about the debt when this country was sending stimulus checks not to the citizens of American slaves, but to every single person. No one asked about the debt when this country sent trillions of dollars to businesses so they continue paying their employees. No one asked about the debt when this country doubled unemployment from 300 a week to 600 a week. No one asked about the debt when this country was spending trillions of dollars to not just develop the vaccines, but study and to distribute them. No one asked about the debt when this country bailed out the banking industry, the home industry, okay? No one asked about the debt when this country canceled hundreds of billions of dollars after World War I and World War II. This country has, not, has canceled debt before, but we ain't canceling ours. So before I wrap up, let me say to you, I understand no tangibles, no vote. I get that. I agree with that. But that's not enough. In order to get the tangibles, we have to run for office and be the candidates that's offering the tangibles. Okay? In order to get the candidate with tangibles in office, we have to support the candidate that's offering tangibles. And let me tell you, I have a message for someone. And Jay, please let me get this message out to this particular person. Roland Martin. I don't need to know for this one. Roland Martin. Bakari Sellers, Torre, all of them. They like to speak condescendingly to us when we say we deserve lineage-based reparations and policies. They like to say, I don't know how the government works. I say to them, we don't need to know how the government works to order to see that it ain't working for us, okay? The second person, Tommy Tuberville, a, a senator from Alabama who said that the rep criminals want reparations. Excuse me? Criminals? The only criminal is a government that owes money and inheritance to its citizens and refuses to pay. And you're the criminal for running on a platform that supports it. Last but not least, Hillary Fordwich. 
a commentator for the British family. When Don Lemon, who sat there like a coward, asked her about reparations, she said to him that we need to start with Africa. Hold on, Africa? If you want us to start with Africa, then those of us who have African ancestry, you would have left us in Africa, okay? The moment you bought captive slaves from the continent of Africa, you took on the debt. It is the continent of Africa that received over 50,000 adventures between 1870 and 1940. It ain't the continent of Africa that when slavery ended, received over $42 trillion from black labor. It ain't the continent of Africa that poisoned our women, raped our people, fed our, our babies to alligators, and poured our drugs into our community. It ain't the continent of Africa that we can go to Africa, we can go to Europe, but ain't the continent of Africa to whom we belong. We already have a nation, and we're gonna start right damn here, okay? It is this country. It is this country that owes us. It is this country that enslaved us. It is this country that has benefited from us. And damn it, it's this country that's gonna pay. Right, next up, we have our own candidate, DC's own Greg Grant, who is running for mayor. He's going to come up and he's going to talk about his platform. Welcome, Brother Red. Power to the people. Power to the people. Absolutely. Uh, I first want to uh, answer a few things because I got some people on uh, Twitter that say I do not support reparations. And that's a lie. I do support reparations, and I say it with my own voice. I don't need nobody on Twitter to say it for me. Um, yeah, I'm running for Mayor of Washington, D.C. I'm the independent candidate running for Mayor of Washington, D.C. When I left the Democrats, they was talking about some red couldn't. You can't do nothing as an independent. I told them, we can do it. We can do it. And now we facing Muriel Bowser head up, and now she's scared as heck. So I'm, I'm not going to stay up here long because there's so many beautiful speakers, but I do want to say this to everybody. We have the power to be powerful. Look around this. This is us. We got the power to be powerful. Let's continue to be powerful. Let's don't be scared of anyone. Let's don't let anybody turn us back. Let's keep smiling. Let's keep laughing. Let our spirit shine through this whole country. And let's don't let anybody stop us. I love everybody. That's why I wanted to come up here today and just tell people how, who I am. I'm Rodney Red Grant. I was born in Washington, D.C., in Southeast Washington, D.C. With a red skin blanket on my back. So I say to y'all again, I do support reparations. Okay, so my platform, I want to make sure our young people are empowered to succeed, first and foremost. I want to make sure that our seniors are incorporated back into society. I want to make sure our displaced and returning citizens are shown the love, care, and respect that they deserve. And I want to make sure our city is safe and affordable to live in again. And I want to break down the barriers that have been separating us as people. That's who I am, as Rodney Red Grant. So thank you all so much. reparations, correct? So when they go back on Twitter and say, when well, nobody talking about reparations, are y'all gonna remind them 
that not only have the speakers addressed it, but Jade addressed it every time she got on this microphone. Every time. I need y'all to do that and make sure when they come up with these lies, we need to make sure that you were told repeatedly the five things that you need to do in order to move reparations. The second thing I want to point out is you've heard about the who. Who should get reparations? The what is reparations? The who shouldn't get reparations? The how you get reparations or the why you should get reparations. I came to talk about the who. Somebody say the how. The how. Well, why is Sister Tesla, I know y'all like to say sister and brother, so I'm going to speak in the late. Why is Sister Tesla talking about the how? Well, because Sister Tesla got a decade plus of receipts on right actual now. successful accomplishments on getting things done in politics. I got plenty of love for the reparationists, but I'm a receipt a niche. <laughs> Meaning I have receipts on exactly how to move policy, receipts on exactly what it means in order to get these folks pay, to pay attention. It's not just about Twitter spaces. It's those who are willing to do this in real places. Give yourself some love for going beyond the Twitter space and being in a real place. A lot of folks don't like me because I stand with Tariq. Can I just explain to you that we don't always agree on everything, but one thing we agree on is that I'm a rider. And what does it mean to be a rider? It means that I, I get it. I know on social media y'all go buy two hot wings and a pepper in. 85.99, sister got back 25.29, but my real government name is Tesla Figaro. You cross the T and you dot the I in Figaro. That means that I'm willing to dox my damn self to be crystal clear about where I stand. And this ain't no disrespect to nobody here. I'm speaking to those in the camera that have been talking about me. Let me do a side angle so they can get a good angle. I'm talking that's been running, amen. That wasn't me, but thank you for the turnaround. <laughs> While you running your mouth under hidden names, on, push the line is why, what I came to talk to you guys about, which is politics until something happens. It requires politics like you heard our brother Marcel talk about. It requires, if you don't want to vote for the person on Tuesday, then the question is, who is going to run on Wednesday? Who's going to run their campaign on Wednesday? Who's going to be the digital content manager? Who's going to be the publicist? Who's going to be the campaign manager? You must, in order to push reparations or anything else that you're interested in, you must actually be the power that you're trying to change. To a lot of the folks in the elite that said they don't get it, they don't understand, that ain't nothing changing between now and Tuesday with these candidates. That might be true, but I got news for you. What's changing between now and Tuesday is now they know we ain't fucking around. Push the line training is about politics until something happens. Push. That means that you push the line in whatever way that you can. You are not focused on what the person on the left is doing, what the person on the right is doing. You're focused on what you can do. What can you do in order to move the ball forward? Critics have said, well, you got to be able to vote for people to put people in office or it's, gonna never, it's not going to never happen. Well, I got news with some of those critics. I'm not going to say their name because it's already been said. I got news with some of those critics. The current administration, most of the elected officials that are in office, they ain't doing this no way. So we are done begging. It is time to vote. I do believe in local politics. I'm not going to stand here and say it's a strategy. You got some people that say don't vote, no tangible. I'm telling you my strategy is to get people to run for office in local elections, state elections, because you're not going to change their mind. They've already been bought. It is time for us to vote. That's right. In California, the Reparations Task Force, that's a state issue. While the federal government is still trying to decide if they're going to do a study or not, California's already doing it. Who 
who is running in the state of California in 2024 to actually vote on that? That's right. That's right. We it put can't them just in place. be Marcel. He's just one. That's right. We right. got to put him in place, grassroots. Right. After today, 10 or 15 of you should be in my next training to figure out how do I run for office to actually get the job done. This is how you push the line. And then I want to know who's going to help them run that campaign. No matter where you live, you can run somebody's campaign. The devil is a lie. No matter where you live, you can contribute your gifts and your talent to put people in office. Even if they lose, you still win. If you're interested in the training, I want you to take your phone out. I'm going to give you the number to text in a second. In uh, September, Jay told you about it, Christy. Shout out to Christy, one of the trainers that I brought. It's a nonpartisan training. We don't talk about issues. We don't talk about agendas. We don't talk about Democrat or Republican. We simply give you the tools. Step one, step two, step three, this is how you run. This is what you need to do. There's five components to it. Campaign roles and responsibilities. Campaign compliance, meaning actually having your paperwork done. Campaign planning, campaign management, and community coalition building. I did another online one in October. I'm gonna offer those same five classes online. I'm coming to some of your cities, but if, I can't, if you can't get it face to face, then get online so that you can get the tools to actually organize. We need 527s. That's a super pack. That's what Bernie Sanders did. That was why he was able to shake up politics. You ain't got to like Bernie Sanders. I checked him myself publicly. But I'm telling you, it's a recipe to it. It's what the Tea Party did. Got to have a 527. If you don't like the no bucking, no vote campaign, then where are our commercials to counter that? All right. Right, right, right. Donate your money to a 527. Somebody should be starting one outside of this where you can support your candidates, not just financially, but also support them with advertisement. If you're going to spend 20 hours a day on Twitter space, then somebody need to have a 527 so that those numbers count. You have to be able to tell these local leaders, hey, we've been able to touch 50,000 people. We've been able to engage. We took a poll. 60% of people believe in reparations. We can create our own poll. But you need a 527 in order to back that up. And then you mix it with your awareness. You mix it with your rallies. You mix it with your YouTube. You mix it with your new black media. All those things are important, but if you are not trying to organize on the local and the state level, nothing changes. But at the same time, you have to be able to put somebody in office, a brand new person that has not been bought. Don't let them tell you, you got a bad background, you can't do it. I got Regina Hill elected in Orlando, Florida. She was arrested 21 times. Somebody say 21. Yeah. Regina Hill, was, I was her campaign man, her communications director, did it from out of town. She was arrested 21 times with a felony, and she won her very first time running for office against seven other candidates. So don't let them tell you you can't run because of your background. If you're interested in the training, you text PUSH THE LINE, P-U-S-H, THE LINE, T-H-E, L-I-N-E, PUSH THE LINE to 66866. The training is free. I went to Congressional Black Boot Camp in 2010. I went to Yale Campaign School for Women. I went to the White House Project. I got the game. I took the knowledge. I'm giving it back to you. I went to Roof List. You name it. Emily's List. All of the top trainings in the country, and there has yet to be one that speaks to people like me and you. That's right. That's right. I've worked on campaigns on the local, the state, and the national. I've called out elected officials, including Bernard Sanders, who was my former employee. I'm the only one that sued his movement for anti-black racism. with my name on it. And won. You may have heard people talk about the wheat and the tear. The new international version gives it to you this way, and this is how I like to quote it. A lot of people say, Willie D said, all tells them, you're one of the goats. You're one of the greatest of our time. You always see people hashtagging goat, 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 greatest of our time. Can I talk to you a moment about the sheep? Yeah. Come on now. The Bible says that it will separate the wheat from the tear. Yeah. But the international version says that when it's all said and done, there's going to be a moment 
when you're going to have to be accountable for what you did. Not challenging me on Twitter space, but accountable for what you have done. And the same way I see this crowd, they say that it's going to divide up down the middle. And it will be a separation from the sheep and the goat. I know y'all want to be the goat. I know y'all want to be the greatest of all time, but I need to talk to you about what it is to be a sheep. And a sheep don't mean go along to get along. A sheep don't mean fold when they come against you like a lot of our brothers and sisters are having to deal with in the media. A sheep don't mean I'm just going to do whatever they say. A sheep is about the shepherd's business. And if you are about the shepherd's business, then you will find yourself doing the work even when don't nobody stand by you. You'll find your work yourself doing the work when they talk about you on Twitter. You'll find yourself doing the work when that HR manager call you in the job and say, was that you on social media? Yeah, 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 yeah. I know y'all don't want to put your real name out there because I know you got something to lose, but you're talking to a bride that lost it all. So I move different because I don't have no problem being an Uber driver. I didn't have no problem going to sell shoes at dealers for 12 hours. I'm a hustler for show for show. And I don't run no nonprofit either. I'm a boss. Him. Don't nobody fund me. I don't take no check. And I don't want your little old cash app. You do need to be funding somebody, but I don't ask for y'all money because I always need to be in a position to tell you to go to hell. But it's something about a soldier that also put their fingerprints on the trigger. Quick story, for those of you that watch Boys in the Hood, if you haven't, leave now. That's a classic. But do y'all remember how Trey, remember when Trey said he was about that business? Yeah. Remember, he was swinging at the air, had blood on his shirt, all up in Neil Long's area, crying and saying he needed to get a little piece just to help him get over. Y'all remember? When it was time to put in work, he defied his daddy. He jumped out the window and said, I'm about that business. Y'all remember? But when it was time to be about the business, shout out to our brother Ice Cube. Oh, no, it wasn't just a coincidence. When it was time to be about the business, what did Trey say? It sounded good until it was time to put in work. And you notice how Ice Cube turned to our brother and looked at him with that look like we knew you wasn't about this business anyway. And he went ahead and let him out the car. I need you to let people in your life out the car. I need you to be comfortable going by yourself. I need you to be the Ice Cube in the movie and be willing to put in work by yourself. And when you go put in work, just like in the movie, I need you to get up out the car. Because he could have just put in work. But he got out the car and he did it face to face. So you could know exactly who did what. That's the type of soldiers I'm looking for. Because it was never meant for Trey to be a soldier. He needed to go on to Morehouse. We need our scholars. Y'all go on with y'all book reading self. We need our scholars. But we need some cubes too. We need some riders too. And today we came to date together to let people know the train is moving. You either with us or against us, but the train is moving. You either on the train or you under the train because we're going to run you over. You either with us or you against us. Shout out to my sister Jay. Shout out to Tariq. I want to be clear. I know he always says he's not a leader, but I do want to be clear and say that he is a visionary. He is a visionary. Give a round of applause for Tariq. He's a visionary. He saw y'all in this crowd when others couldn't see it, including me, because I was nervous, y'all. I ain't gonna lie. I didn't know if y'all was gonna show up. But he kept his cool and he said they coming. So shout out to him for having the vision that many of your elected officials would never do. And I respect him for that. I don't agree with everything he do and how he do it. But I respect consistency. I respect riders. I respect those that's willing to call out the powers that be on a daily basis and get the death threats that come with it. My name is Tesla Figaro, www.teslafigaro.com.